Okay, so welcome everyone to the day three of the workshop. Uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, uh, genome-free transcript reconstruction and uh, the, the analysis framework we have for uh, studying RNA-seq when you, when you don't have a genome. And uh, the afternoon we'll be focusing on, on annotating transcripts, so trying to gain functional information about the transcripts that we've reconstructed. Uh, so a few learning objectives for the modules uh, for, for this morning. Uh, one is just to understand uh, the various challenges involved in reconstructing transcripts from RNA-seq data. We did cover a little bit of that um, yesterday. Uh, Obi described the, the string tie algorithm, and, um, and I'll make reference to uh, similar approaches here and how it differs from uh, doing it without a genome. And we're going to become uh, more familiar with the different algorithms and data structures uh, that are involved in, in doing transcript assembly, particularly uh, genome-free. Uh, you'll be able to appreciate the, uh, the importance of, of strand-specific RNA-seq more so than, than maybe you had before. And uh, we're going to learn various ways to uh, assess the quality of the assembled transcript that we have. So as we know, with RNA-seq, especially with the, the Illumina platform, which is really the, the dominating technology these days, uh, the, the reads that you get from the machine are, are much smaller than the, the transcripts you're actually starting with. So uh, we need to have a way to be able to take the short reads and reconstruct the, the, the full-length transcripts. And there are a couple of different approaches for doing this. Um, and and you know, it depends on whether you have a, a reference genome to start with or not. Because uh, if, if you have a reference genome, you could, of course, just align the reads directly to the genome, as you've, you've done the last uh, couple of days. And then we have uh, tools that can take the alignments and reconstruct transcripts based on those alignments, reconstructing uh, the, the full-length transcript form sequences that are best supported by the reads. But, of course, there, there are limitations here, because uh, you might not have a, a, a beautiful reference genome for the, the organism that you're working with. Uh, or the genome you have might be uh, a draft genome, or it might be just full of gaps, and uh, it's still useful, but maybe you can't uh, rely on it entirely for the work that you want to do. Uh, so we have other options. We can just take the reads and assemble the reads themselves uh, without using a, a genome. And then if we have our, our draft genome or we have a genome of a related organism that we want to leverage to gain more insights into our transcripts, uh, we can then align those transcript sequences, those reconstructed transcript sequences, uh, to that genome using a splice aligner. And that can give us some more information about where the uh, introns and exons might lie within uh, the structure of the transcript. And there are lots and lots of tools that have been developed for this over the last uh, decade. Uh, it's been a very active area of uh, research and development. So you have lots of tools to choose from. Uh, some tools are, are more popular than others. And uh, you've, you've gotten to uh, learn about um, certain of these, like uh, Top Hat, Star, HiSat, uh, GSnap, maybe you haven't heard of, but it's another tool that was developed for doing short read alignment. And then for transcript reconstruction, we had cufflinks, and now um, we're using string tie. Uh, but there are lots of different algorithms for doing that, too. And similarly, when it comes to, to assembling transcripts at de novo, genome free, uh, you'd have lots of options. Um, we developed the Trinity software, but of course you have, um, you have many different tools for, for doing this sort of thing. So there's some similarities between, um, between genome-guided reconstruction and genome-free reconstruction, uh, at least conceptually. Uh, the main goal with, with, both, with any kind of transcript reconstruction is to take the RNA-seq reads and to try to encode it into a, um, some sort of a graph structure. Uh, and the graph structure will encode the, uh, the sequence information, the order of the reads, uh, the orientation of the reads, and indicate overlaps among the reads. And it's just an example of a, of a graph structure that we might have, uh, where the nodes would rep represent the, the sequences that have been already oriented, and, um, and the edges indicate the, the order of those sequences and the, the orientation and the overlap. And the goal with, with reconstructing the transcript sequences is basically to find a path uh, from left to right within this ordered graph uh, that's, that's best supported by the reads or the alignments, in case we have alignments of the reads. And, um, and given, given a path through that graph, 
uh, we can then just reconstruct uh, the transcript as, a, as just traversing those nodes of sequence uh, in, that, in that order. <clears throat> and different paths to the graph would give you uh, different transcript sequences, so different transcript isoforms. Uh, now, one way we could do this is just to uh, take all the reads and just identify all the overlaps among those reads. And we can just treat each, each read as a node in our graph and just traverse the overlaps to then reconstruct the final transcript sequences. Uh, it's, it's a fine approach, uh, but the problem is that it doesn't, it doesn't scale well. Right? It might work fine when you have thousands of reads, you know, but once you start generating millions and billions of reads, uh, determining all the overlaps among all those reads can be computationally challenging. If you just look at the, uh, if you have, if you look at the number of alignments that you require for determining overlaps as a function of the number of reads, you can see that it grows exponentially. All right, it's just not something that's feasible with uh, short read data, where you have millions and millions of reads you're working with. Feel free to ask questions. You know, this can be very interactive. So. Um, so in, in short, this is this is really an impractical way of of uh, going about uh, short read assembly. So we want to be able to avoid uh, doing all these these pairwise alignments, or avoid doing all these millions or billions of pairwise alignments um, to establish relationships between the sequences. And um, so it's a very popular data structure that's been used to uh, to basically encode the information in the reads. And, and from that, um, determine uh, which reads overlap each other and the extent of their overlaps. And it's called the De Bruijn graph. And the way you construct the De Bruijn graph is uh, by breaking the reads down into individual k-mers. Right? But the k-mers are these short strings um, with a uh, word size. In this case, in this example, we have a word size of 5. Uh, but in general, it might be 25 or 30. Um, and basically just take all the, these words, all these overlapping words from the reads, and we just start the, at the one end. We can start at the, the left side and just pull out the first camer. And each camer is going to become a node and a, a graph. So in this case, we're going to construct this De Bruijn graph by adding this one camer as a single node in this graph. And then what we do is we just move that window over by one base. Okay, as you can see, that this next camer overlaps the first camer by all but one base. Right? It's k minus one length overlap. And we take that camer and then we add that that camer as another node in the graph. And then we can just draw an edge between those nodes, indicating that they're adjacent within the read, and they overlap by k minus one bases. And we do this for all the reads. If we come across the same camer in a different read, we don't add that as a new node in the graph. We basically just reuse the existing node that's already there in the graph. Okay, so the number of, of nodes in the graph is just going to be equal to the number of unique camers that we have in our entire read data set. Okay, and once we do that, we can end up with a, a structure that looks a little bit more complex. Uh, but again, every every node in the graph is a camer. And every edge indicates a k minus one overlap, and we'll end up with these these bubbles and branching patterns on the graph uh, anytime we encounter sequence variation. Okay, and that sequence variation it could be resulting from uh, it could be a polymorphism, all right? Because all we need is a single base change to get you a, a unique camer sequence, uh, or it could be result from um, alternative splicing, all right? Because because Alternatively spliced isoforms are going to have some regions that are, are shared sequences, but they're going to have other regions that are going to be um, unique to those isoforms. Right? So any, any of those points will diverge, and you'll see these, these bubbles and branches within the graph. So we built this De Bruijn graph, and one of the first things that we generally do is, is simplify it, because you'll find that there's these long stretches of unbranched regions, right? where it's just one camera linking to another camera. Um, and we can just collapse those down into uh, single nodes, where that node just has 
more sequence information attached to it, or right? it's basically collapsing down those overlapping cameras into one one node with one sequence. So this is a much simpler graph to work with. And then uh, we can basically traverse that graph just like we did before from left to right. We can find paths through the graph from left to right. And each path could give us a different transcript sequence or could reconstruct a different transcript isoform. Now, which path you choose in the graph to traverse is going to depend highly on a number of factors. Right, earlier on uh, yesterday when uh, Obi was describing string tie, there's a this network flow algorithm where right? he was trying to find a maximum flow uh, to define uh, what, what path was going to be the first path it was going to traverse. Okay, so, so network flow is one way we could try to address this problem and determining which paths uh, we should choose. But there's a lots of different ways. There's, there's many different algorithms for trying to, uh, to address this. Um, a lot of it you know, boils down to different uh, algorithms, computer science, you know, some, some of the more um, classical algorithms like um, what, are the, what are the minimum paths? You do a minimum path coverage uh, criterion and, and determine what's the minimum number of paths you need in order to traverse every node in the graph at least once. Um, there's lots of different, different ways of doing this. But ideally, the paths that we report are going to be those that are going to be uh, best supported by the underlying RNA-seq data. All right. In this case, we would have four different paths, and if we traverse each of the four paths, we would end up with a different sequence. If we line those sequences, we can see that there's differences. Uh, there's a polymorphism in there, and then you also have a, a large um, a deletion. So genome-free uh, transcriptome assembly uh, uses similar algorithms to uh, genome assemblers. Okay, they both use this, this De Bruyne graph structure. But there are some important differences between how a, a genome assembler uses a De Bruyne graph to reconstruct genomes as compared to a transcript assembler where it's using a De Bruyne graph to reconstruct uh, transcriptomes. And this is actually, this is one of the key reasons why we built Trinity in the first place, because it was about 10 years ago um, when uh, Illumina, what was Slux at the time, um, came on the scene, and we had, we had ways of now generating you know, millions and millions of short reads, and we needed ways to, um, to reconstruct transcripts from, from these data and use them for annotating genomes and uh, doing transcript research. And th there were no good tools that were developed at the time to, to do this, right? There were tools for doing genome assembly. There were tools like Velvet and Abyss, um, where they used the broom graphs and they would reconstruct genomes. But if you took those tools and applied them to transcriptome data or RNA-seq data, uh, you would not get a very good result. All right? We really needed to have the tools that were tuned to the, the differences between trying to assemble RNA-seq data and to get transcripts versus DNA-seq data for, for genomes. And it's a lot of it boils down to the, the tools have different expectations. They have different goals. With genome assembly, your expectation is that you're going to have relatively uniform coverage of your reads across the entire genome. All right, there'll be dips in coverage due to GC content and uh, re repetitive regions um, and you know certain biases, but overall you expect to have relatively uniform coverage across the, the entire genome. With transcriptome assembly, we have very different expectation here. We have some transcripts that are expressed at very low levels. We have other transcripts that are expressed at extremely high levels. Right? And the, the dynamic range can be you know, 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 7th between them. Uh, so we have uh, you know, very different types of transcripts in terms of the read coverage that we expect to see. With a genome assembler, if it comes across a region that has a very, very high coverage, it's not going to think this is, a, this is a highly expressed region of the genome. No, that doesn't make sense. Right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to think it's a, repeat, it's a repeat region. And a lot of times they'll take those reads and just put them in a separate bucket right? and maybe deal with it later. Um, when you do, so when you apply your genome assembler to transcriptome data, all of your highly expressed genes end up being all well, highly expressed transcripts end up getting put aside into a you know into a bin and maybe uh, not assembled at all. Uh, so that's uh, that's one of the huge problems. Uh, with genome assembly, you expect to have a, a single contig reconstructed uh, per gene. All right. Ideally, you get entire chromosomes reconstructed. All right, as single molecules. Uh, in the case of uh, transcriptome data, we expect to have multiple contigs reconstructed per gene if we have evidence for alternative splicing. 
In the case of genome assembly, we're expecting to assemble you know, large contigs, like entire chromosomes, like I said. Um, in the case of transcriptome assembly, uh, we're expecting not to generate you know, mega, mega base size uh, sequences, but instead uh, smaller sequences. On average, maybe a few KB, you know, two or three KB, and, uh, and many thousands of these. Another key difference has to do with uh, the, the type of data that you're inputting into the assembler. With genome assembly, the, the data, the DNA-seq data that you're using is inherently double-stranded. But with RNA-seq data, we can generate strand-specific data, right? and that's really critical, especially if you want to be able to, um, uh, to differentiate sense transcription from antisense transcription. And um, there's very good strand-specific RNA-seq protocols that are, are very popular right now. And if you're generating RNA-seq on your own and you have the option to do strand-specific RNA-seq versus non-strand-specific, always take the strand-specific option if you can. Um, a lot of times they're not perfect, but still like 99% of, of the reads will be um, strand, have, have the correct uh, uh, strand after sequencing. And again, this is why we developed Trinity uh, about 10 years ago now, was to tackle a lot of these, these problems. And, and Trinity has been, uh, it's come a long way over the last 10 years to improve on this. Another difference um, between Trinity and uh, other, other assemblers, and just in general, other genome assemblers, other transcriptome assemblers, is, is how we, um, we build our graphs. A lot of these other tools will develop one big graph and then just try to tease the transcripts apart from that one large graph structure. Uh, in Trinity, we try to partition the data, partition the reads into uh, smaller graphs, where ideally, uh, we'll have one graph per gene, and that in each graph will represent the transcriptional complexity of that gene. And this works out very well for us in terms of the, um, the uh, uh, being able to perform parallel computing, because each graph basically becomes a separate compute job. Reconstructing the transcripts for that gene represents a separate, like isolated compute job. And if you, have a, if you have a big compute farm, you know, with hundreds or thousands of nodes, we can basically fan off all these, these jobs onto the compute farm and have them all run in parallel. And then once they're all done, all the results just come back and, and uh, you have your final assembly. Uh, so it's very convenient. So here's a, a general overview for how Trinity works. Uh, we originally called it Trinity because uh, it had three major parts, and there were actually three of us that, that um, developed the code. Uh, myself, uh, Moran Yassour, uh, was a PhD student at the time, she's now a postdoc with Eric Lander, um, and this is actually her, her PhD project, and, um, and I was, I've been at the Broad for 10 years now, and, uh, and I got involved in the project early on just because I was particularly interested in um, having good tools for being able to reconstruct transcripts from RNA-seq data to use for genome annotation. And then there's a very talented uh, scientist and engineer, uh, Manfred grab uh, who had a lot of experience in, um, in genome assembly. And, um, and he's uh, since moved on. He's now at, um, at Uppsala in the, the Sci Life Lab as a professor. Uh, so I'm the one that remained, and I, I'm keeping uh, the, the Trinity legacy going uh, to the extent possible. Uh, so we have these three different modules. Uh, we have uh, inchworm, chrysalis, and butterfly. Um, I wrote the, the inchworm tool, Manfred wrote chrysalis, and, uh, and Moran Yassour wrote butterfly. Uh, so inchworm takes the RNA-seq reads and it builds uh, contigs from those RNA-seq reads. <clears throat> it does it very, um, uh, very fast and, um, and it's, it's a very it, it draft sort of contigs, all right? So it generates contigs, but they're, they're not in any way supposed to represent like a final product of doing transcriptome assembly. And I'll describe how this works. It basically just takes uh, the unique camers within the reads and uh, does a, a greedy extension to, to build out these contigs. And, uh, and we'll walk through the, the details because uh, it's, it's fun as well as interesting. And once we have these linear contigs and chrysalis these linear contexts basically represent the unique parts of isoforms. Uh, so you might have uh, 
you know, a full length transcript isoform is represented by uh, a few different inchworm contigs. All right, and Crystal's job is basically to find the different parts, the different inchworm contigs that correspond to, likely correspond to the same gene. Uh, just represent different <coughs> unique parts of an alternatively spliced gene, and it clusters them together. And once we have the, these clusters of contigs uh, that represent the different parts of isoforms, um, it then constructs this proper de Bruijn graph structure that, that I, I described earlier. And once we have this, this uh, de Bruijn graph, butterfly will come in and it'll take the original reads and thread the reads through the graph structure to try to figure out what are the paths that are actually best supported by those reads in the graph. Okay, and then it'll actually provide you with the, the, the final transcript sequences. So I'm going to walk through this, uh, starting with the inchworm algorithm. <clears throat> so what inchworm first does is it takes, takes our read sequence, and as we are talking about before, we're building a de Bruijn graph, we're going to extract the Kamer sequences. Now, we're not going to actually build a de Bruijn graph. We're just going to do the, the first part. We're going to just walk through and pull out all the, the Kamers that overlap by... Uh, by k minus one, and that's going to do is it's going to instead of building a graph, we're just going to build a, a table. A table that has uh, two columns. Uh, one column is going to be the Kamer sequence. Uh, the other column is going to be the number of times we've seen that Kamer in the entire set of reads. Okay, and we, in computer science, we we tend to call this a, a hash table. Okay, we basically have a key and a value, key value pairs. So in this case, our key would be a Kamer sequence. And if we look up that key, that key in our table, it gives the count of how many times uh, we've seen that Kamer in the data set. And the first thing Inchworm is going to do is it's going gonna, it's gonna to determine a, a seed Kamer that it wants to start to use to build out a contig. And the way it defines a seed is it just chooses the Kamer that has the highest count in the table. Okay, so we'll pretend that that's uh, Gattaca, all right, the famous, the most famous of all cameras. Uh, so we start with Gattaca, and Gattaca is found. <laughs> Gattaca is found nine times. There's a whole, there's a movie made about it, so it's yeah, you know, yeah, it's very famous. <laughs> so it's it's found nine times, and we we pull that out, and it's basically what we're going to do is we're going to try to we're going to start from Gattaca, and we're basically going to going to build a Conte sequence by extending from. Uh, from both ends. And we do this in a greedy fashion. And so we start with Gattaca and we look, okay, well, if we're going to extend it by just one base, uh, which base would it be? And since our, our alphabet for nucleotides only has four characters in it, and we only have four possibilities, right? We can extend with a G, an A, or T, or a C. We just have to figure out which one, you know, which letter are we going to choose to extend our contig. And all we do is just look up um, each of the four possible overlapping cameras in our data set. Just start, so the overlapping camera would start with A, right, and it would end with one of these four bases. So we just look through and say, okay, look up in our, in our table, uh, how many times do we find Attica ending with a G? And we find four times. All right, and then we look up the next one, ending with an A. Yeah, it's only found one time. T, we look up in our table, it's not even there. So, so T is not an option. If we wanted to extend this with a T, we just couldn't because there's, there's actually no Kamer that ended with T in our entire read set. And then go down to C, and we find that Kamer is found four times. Ideally, if we found one that was the, had the highest count, we would just take it and go with it. Okay? Um, but in the case where we have ties, then it gets a little bit more complicated, because then we have to break the tie. All right? So we have a tie. We basically have to look out from the G and the C. We do the same sort of thing. And C, you know, if we, if we just go out one more base, can we break the tie? Uh, as we look up all the other cameras, and we find, yes, we can break the tie. Um, the A wins, so we're going to go in this direction. Okay, and we basically just keep doing this one base at a time until we hit tie cases, and we have tie cases, and we have to um, go out a little bit further to break the ties. So we keep just keep extending it one base at a time until you get to a point, and then there's, there's just you look up each of the four possible cameras, and none of them are on our table. All right, well, if none are on our table, then we have to stop. All right, so that's how we stop extending at that end. So once we finished extending to the right, we basically do the same thing, but now we extend to the left. Okay, so we just basically go in this direction, 
look up the cameras in our table to figure out what the greedy extension would be. Uh, take that greedy extension and just keep on keep on going until we run out of options, and then we stop. Once we stop, we report that contig sequence. And this would be our, our first inchworm contig to be reconstructed. And then we go through this contig. Any camer that's in that contig, we remove from our data table. Okay, remove from our hash table. So any, any camer that we use can only be used once. Okay, it'll only show up in a single contig. Yeah, so we're going to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> That's why this is not the final output from Trinity. Uh, so this is just a, it's a useful intermediate, right? This is a useful first phase uh, to, to basically pull out the, the unique parts of transcripts, right, that are essentially best supported by the reads uh, because we're doing this, this greedy extension. So we have multiple options. You, know, you might have a sequencing error, and you have the real the real base and the real base will oftentimes have a much higher count than the sequencing error would be. Right. Yeah. Do you have a fast way to figure out which is the highest count? Otherwise, it'd be n squared if you have to go through them all, right? Yeah, you just sort, you do initial sort stuff. So after you build your table, you just sort it by count, and then everything's already you know pre-sorted. Yeah. Yeah, so I have to do the sort stuff once, and that is this a hash table? The lookups are quick, so in a like, constant time. Okay, so we remove the cameras from uh, from the data table, and we basically just start the process all over again. We choose the next seed that hasn't been used yet, extend it to the left, or extend it to the right, extend it to the left, uh, re remove uh, those those cameras, and keep going. And eventually, your, your you know your data table becomes completely empty, and that's when Inchworm is actually finished. And Inchworm reports all of its uh, the contigs that it was able to reconstruct. Uh, but we do have this problem, as Francis uh, pointed out. Um, in the case of, of uh, alternative splicing, yeah, yeah, sure. From the sort of numbers of, of, of sequences we have to deal with, this first step removes what? Like, it reduces the space by uh, Oh, um, yeah, I mean, um, in terms of total numbers of reads, I mean, if you're starting out with like a billion reads, yeah. Yeah, you could end up with like a million contigs. So, but it also I mean, it depends on the, the complexity of the, the data set you're working with too. Because uh, you have a billion reads from like yeast, then uh, it's a huge, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so, so with, uh, in the case we have alternative splicing, we have, we have um, in this case, isoform A and isoform B. They have some regions that they, they share. So in this case, they share the orange, they share the green. Uh, but isoform A has this yellow piece that is unique to isoform A. All right, and if we're going to run um, inchworm on this, you know, inchworm is not going to be able to reconstruct both isoform A and isoform B because every camera can be used only once. We right? have to show up in one, one isoform or the other isoform, assuming that it got one or the other. If we're going to have a, a graphical representation of, of these isoform structures, it might look something like this. And um, if isoform A is lowly expressed and isoform B is highly expressed, uh, we might represent that um, by weighting the, uh, the edges. Uh, in this case, isoform, isoform uh, B is highly expressed. We have this, this darker edge. Let's see if I actually use my, there we go. Yeah, this works. Uh, so we have a, a thicker edge here indicating that there's more read support, basically, uh, for going this path, because uh, there's more camers for the more highly expressed transcript. All right, so Vinchworm is going to reconstruct uh, a contig from the camers that are represented by these two isoforms. It'd probably just give us this. All right, it would maybe start over here somewhere, and then take this path, and then um, give us the green segment. All right, so it'll give us a nice full-length contig for the more highly expressed isoform. And then later on, it might reseed on a unique sequence that's in the yellow region. Right? When it pulls out that contig, it's going to pull out mostly just the, the yellow bits because these two can have no camers shared in common. Right? Every camer that Inchworm uses has to be unique. All right, so these actually have they have no cameras in common, 
Uh, but they can have they can have k minus one mers in common. Okay, so that's sort of the trick here. We can use k minus one to help define relationships among these parts of the isoforms. So if, if two inchworm contigs share a k minus one, then there's a, a chance that they might actually be related. And we can confirm that relationship by looking in, at the reads and saying, do we actually find reads that actually support um, uh, the link between these two contigs? All right, that's really the goal of chrysalis. Chrysalis comes in, takes the inchworm contigs, looks for k minus one overlaps. If it finds k minus one overlap, then it looks at the reads and says, okay, is there actually reads in the data set that support the junction between these two inchworm contigs? And can they really do go together? And if that's the case, then it'll cluster them together. So there's just a general overview of, of uh, the Crystal's framework. Um, so starting with our inchworm contigs, we integrate these isoforms uh, based on the k minus one overlaps. Uh, we use the read information as we call it glue. Uh, the reads are used as glue to sort of glue the contigs together. And, um, and we also use the read information here too. So if we have two contigs, um, maybe they don't have a k minus one over, uh, k minus one overlap. Um, in this case, it looks like they actually have overlap. But in any case, we use we use the paired end information and paired end RNA seq data to also try to associate inform contigs with each other as part of the clustering. And then once we have these clusters, then we build the De Bruijn graph structure. And this is really how we end up with our, our many thousands of of these clusters, or even thousands of graphs. This is how we're sort of partitioning all the data. So then in the next, so this, here we go. Uh, so in the final step, butterfly comes in. And butterfly is actually going to do the, uh, the transcript reconstruction given the graphs and given the reads. Uh, for every De Bruijn graph, it first goes through that stage of compacting the De Bruijn graph. All right, so if we have these long stretches that are unbranched, it'll collapse the nodes down into single nodes. Um, they have uh, more sequence information. And then it takes the reads and it threads the reads through the graph in order to identify those paths that are best supported by the paths that individual reads take, in addition to uh, read pair uh, linking information from paired end sequencing. And the, the, uh, the repairs were used during the, the clustering of the contigs, uh, but be, but other than that, no, it's uh, it's mainly just used for the, the clustering of the contigs in the crystal stage, and then in the final reconstruction stage when using from butterfly. Right. So butterfly basically just gives us the, the resulting sequences. We just have some a uh, few examples of, of how this has been useful um, in mouse. Um, and mouse is a, is a nice uh, test case for us because we actually have a reference genome. Uh, so when we reconstruct transcripts de novo, we can always go back and look at the genome and say, okay, well, how, how good did we actually do? Uh, here's a, a very simple case where if we look at, at, at the graph structure that we have uh, for one of our graphs, uh, we only have three nodes. So this is almost as simple as it gets. Um, and uh, in this case, we have a blue node, a red node, and a green node. And uh, we have labels on the edges indicating how many reads actually uh, support linking this node uh, to the, the next node. There's really only two paths we can take in order to reconstruct transcripts from this. We can go from the, the blue node to the green node, and we reconstruct one transcript. Uh, and if we take the other path, uh, through the red node, and then we end up with uh, this other isoform, or this little red piece. Red piece is short, it's only 130 bases here in this, this red node. And if we didn't have a genome, then all we know is that we have, we have two, presumably two transcript isoforms. You know, they're different from each other, and that one has the red piece and the other one doesn't. All right? But we don't really know what is that red piece. Is it, is it a skipped exon? Is it an alternative uh, donor or acceptor splice site at an exon? You know, has it really correspond to in terms of the, the overall structure of the transcripts? And you really need a genome in order to, to be able to infer that. And in, the case, in this case, if we map 
these two isoforms back to the genome and look at uh, where do these sequences fall, we can see that the little red bit is actually a um, skipped exon. Exon that's skipped in one isoform and not the other. So having a genome, even if it's the genome of a related organism, it's, it's really useful for trying to gain more insights into the, the, the structure of the transcripts that you've reconstructed um, de novo. Can you also let us know how complete RefSeq is? How complete RefSeq is? For mouse. For mouse. So how many of, of the transcripts you generate this way are not in RefSeq? Uh, yeah, we're, we're going to touch on that, but <laughs> yeah. So, so like for any of these for any of these data sets. No, 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 no. It's, it's an important point. Um, so this goes into the topic of of uh, how messy transcriptomics can be. Um, so, so in general, when we have reference data sets that we're working with for human or mouse, you know, we talked about yesterday. We're, we're talking about I think uh, uh, the human data set whose gen code. And um, there's about 200,000 transcripts in our reference data set. All right. How many genes is that? I think it's like 50,000 genes or something around that. Um, but typically people say, like, how many genes are there in human? And there's a contest. And I think they, they said it was like 30,000 or so uh, was the number they, they uh, settled on. Uh, but anyway, we're talking about you know, tens of thousands of genes and hundreds, you know, maybe a couple hundred thousand uh, total transcripts uh, for mouse or human. And um, when you do a, a de novo transcriptome assembly, you end up with a, a lot more than that. All right? There's, a lot, of, there's a, lot of, a lot of transcription that's happening, and there's a lot of, of transcripts that you'll reconstruct um, that are not necessarily included by your, your reference. Okay? Uh, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, this is one that could go on for like hours about this. But, um, in general, you'll capture a lot of the you know, the known protein coding genes, uh, which are, are pretty well characterized. Um, but you'll end up with tons of, of non-coding RNA transcripts uh, expressed from different regions of the genome. And they, they won't necessarily be um, in your reference annotation data set. Uh, it might be because the reference data sets are really based on, um, you know, well-studied tissues. You know, once you, start, once you start digging into different tissues or even in the single cell transcriptomes, you end up finding lots of novel transcription that's just not captured by um, the reference data set. Uh, again, most protein coding genes are, are pretty well captured, but there's just tons of, of non-coding transcription that is presumably biologically relevant. Um, a lot of it has to do with just um, transcription that really, the product of transcription might, well, I think it's a lot of different ways. Um, Enhancers are transcribed. There's lots of transcription that happens that's biologically relevant, but the actual product, the actual RNA product itself, you know, whether that actually has a specific function um, is, is highly questionable. Uh, so how many genes do we have? How many transcripts are there? These are questions that will never be answered um, in a way that most people will agree on, uh, at least within my lifetime. Uh, so just, just be aware of that. Uh, how's, how's that? Is that good enough? Or is that's very good. All right. <laughs> that's all right. No, it's it's it's, it's good. That's good. Uh, it just as an aside. So I mean, I, so I work on reference data sets. I also work on lots of non-reference data sets. And um, and one of the one of the studies that we published on most recently has, is the the salamander transcriptome, see the axolotl, the Mex Mexican salamander, and it's it's a model organism for looking at. Um, uh, limb regeneration. All right, so it's really fascinating. Uh, but the genome is huge. Genome is like 30 billion bases, or 10 times bigger than the human genome. And, um, and we, we assembled the, the transcript up for this. We ended up with over 1.4 million transcripts being assembled. All right. uh, it's got a big genome, but how many genes does it have? It's thought to have around you know, 30,000 genes, like human or mouse. Um, and the genome is just huge because of an ancient uh, repeat expansion due to mobile elements. And um, but still, you end up with 1.4 million transcripts. Um, we started off with like over a billion RNA seq reads. The more reads you sequence, the the more transcripts you'll end up reconstructing. Right? There's lots of stuff that's very lowly expressed. And if you go deep enough, um, even the human genome. If you go deep enough, it looks like the entire human genome is basically transcribed. And there's there's lots of controversy around that too. Um, 
So yeah, just just things to be aware of. But if you start applying things like uh, minimum expression thresholds, all right, let's say say uh, you know one one transcript per million is thought, to, or one FPKM even um, is thought to represent around one transcript per cell. Okay, so if you want to consider that to be like a reasonable threshold, if you filter out all the stuff that's that's less than say one TPM, you know, you'll end up with you know a hundred thousand transcripts and maybe thirty thousand genes. Okay, but there's just tons of stuff that you can. Yeah, you know, once you go deep enough, you have enough material to actually reconstruct transcripts on, and um, and you start seeing lots of regions of the genome lighting up that maybe you, know, you hadn't expected. Um, and is it biologically relevant or not? You know, it's it's, it's uh, um, maybe. <laughs> Different cell types, different tissue types. Um, there's lots of really interesting things that are happening that you only see once you start digging in very deeply and, and have a very uh, a sharp focus on, on that cell type. All right, back to business. Um, so another example uh, with, with butterfly. Here we end up with a, uh, a case where we don't actually have two isoforms. We actually have transcripts from two parologous genes. All right, but but these genes are highly similar. I think they're like 95% identical, and they have some regions that are unique, and they have some re regions that um, uh, that, that are are uh, shared. And we find that they end up getting clustered together into the same graph. All right, so here's a graph, and we can see we have regions that are shared here in the middle, and we have regions that are are unique in each. Uh, but because we have good paired end information. Uh, we can use the paired end linkage information, to, and, and um, if we had longer reads, we could use that too. But in this case, they're short read data. Uh, we can primarily use the the paired end read information to tease these apart and basically unzip these structures into their separate uh, parologous transcripts. And this is just to show that what we reconstructed and, and what it looks like when you map it to the reference genome, and you can see they're, they're basically spot on with uh, the reference transcripts. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, given the option, strand-specific data is absolutely preferred. Right? Any, ch any chance you have of, of uh, getting strand-specific RNA-seq, you want to be able to capitalize on that. And there's a couple reasons for it. And the one I mentioned earlier is just biologically, you're able to separate sense transcription from anti-sense transcription. And I have a nice example that shows where that's biologically relevant. Uh, but another reason is just it simplifies the assembly process. Because um, if you have double-stranded data, then yeah, you, you pull out any given camer, that camer is going to be represented in the graph in both its forward orientation and also its reverse complement orientation. All right, they're both going to basically mean the same thing. And um, if we have strand specific data, then we can actually we can tell the difference between the forward camer and its reverse complement camer. They're actually two separate nodes in the graph. All right, so it allows us to basically separate these things out, and that greatly simplifies um, our ability to reconstruct uh, the, the final transcripts. Uh, a while back, um, uh, Josh Levin, who's at the Broad Institute, is one of my collaborators. Um, he, he did a, a very well-known study on uh, looking at different RNA-seq methods that are available for doing strand-specific RNA-seq, and he settled on the, this DUTP second strand marking method as, um, as being the leading protocol. And I'll, I'll walk you through what that is briefly. Um, it's, it's basically, this is the standard way that strand-specific RNA-seq is being done these days, and there are really good kits for it. Uh, so if we start up with uh, our RNA sequence template, uh, the first thing we're going to do, uh, we're going to do a first strand synthesis with just normal DNTPs, okay, generate our first strand cDNA. But then when we do the second strand synthesis, instead of using thymine, we throw in uracil. Okay, and we know uracil is not a standard DNA base, right? it's an RNA base. And um, if this ever, ever, you don't actually find DTTP as, as a naturally occurring base, as far as I know. Um, that would be a, a dangerous thing to have happen in the cell. Um, but there are cases where DNA can get damaged, and, um, and uh, cytosines end up being deaminated to, uh, uh, to uracil. Okay? And, that's, and that's a problem. Um, and if it's not repaired, it could lead to a mutation. Okay, but we have really good DNA repair enzymes that will recognize, hey, if I see a uracil in DNA, I know that doesn't belong. It'll pop it out, and then the rest of the DNA repair machinery will come in and actually replace it and uh, restore it to its original base. Okay? Uh, but in molecular biology, we can actually leverage these enzymes, um, and we can 
put them in a tube and we can sell them as a kit. And um, any place we have this uracil in our second strand synthesis, we can basically remove using uh, these DNA repair enzymes. So this is a bit of a trick. When we, when we let's take a step back here. When we do the second strand synthesis and we include the U's in the uh, second strand, we then do adapter ligation. Okay, so you can see we have the yellow and we have the red um, Y adapters right on each end. And if we, if we didn't remove the U's and we're going to do sequencing, let's say we started the sequencing at the yellow primer, right? Then our sequencing would go into the blue for some sequencing products and, and we start over here in the yellow it would lead into the pink for other sequencing products, all right? We'd effectively be sequencing both strands. But if we use this fancy DNA repair enzyme uh, to remove the U's, this pink strand cannot be used as a template in PCR, all right? We're basically destroying the pink strand. So now, all the sequencing that we do from the yellow has to go into the blue. Right? We'll never see any yellow going into pink. All right, and that's really the key point here. This is how we get our strand-specific sequencing. Because only one of the strands can actually be used as a template for sequencing uh, downstream. All right, this is really just very, very clever. And then why is this important? Um, let's have a couple examples here. Uh, here's an example. It's actually, it's, it's, it's important for a lot of things. I mean, sense in any sense, of course. Um, but if you're working with compact genomes, all right, where the, geno the genes are very closely spaced next to each other, um, there's a lot of transcription, where the transcription like from one gene can run off into the other gene. Um, then having the strand-specific RNA-seq can really help tease them apart. Uh, so this is just a case. This is one of our, our favorite cases. We do a lot of work with S. Pombe. And um, here we have, uh, have strand-specific RNA-seq. And these are just the reference genes down here. So here we have uh, one reference gene that's going to the right. Uh, we have another gene that's on the bottom strand going to the left. And uh, since we have strand-specific RNA-seq, we can actually separate out the coverage and look at the coverage on the top strand versus the bottom strand separately. All right, so here we can see the top strand coverage, and here we have the bottom strand coverage. Now, we, and we can see that you know, this transcription overlaps right, in the regions between these two genes. Um, but because we have strand-specific RNA-seq, we can actually tease that apart. And when we do the actual reconstruction using Trinity, uh, we actually do reconstruct these transcripts as, as separate transcripts, and um, each in their proper orientation. And they're allowed to overlap here in the middle. It's not a problem. Uh, but if we didn't have strand-specific RNA-seq, what would we end up with? Yeah, one big, one big transcript, all right? Uh, if we look at the coding regions, we see, oh, there's a huge coding region on, on the upper left, and there's a huge coding region on the, the bottom right. Um, but other than that, and we do just reconstructing transcripts, you know, it's just like one big transcript. Um, and that's really not ideal. Uh, here's another example. Um, and again, in our S. Pombe fission yeast. Uh, in this case, we have three genes. They're all on the bottom strand. And uh, we have our, our strand-specific RNA-seq coverage profiles in the middle. And we can see that, at least for the genes that are on the ends here, the RNA-seq coverage that we have is consistent with the transcribed, you know, the, the, um, uh, the coding region orientation for that reference gene. All right? But in the middle here, we can see for this uh, meiosis-specific protein kinase, all the transcription that we have is actually on the other strand. All right. If we didn't have strand-specific data, then we wouldn't recognize that basically every bit of transcription that we have here is, is antisense transcription. And this actually turns out to be important um, for this organism, that many of these uh, um, meiosis-specific genes are down-regulated by antisense transcription. All right, so it's important biology that we can capture here if we have access to um, the strand-specific methods. Now, when we run Trinity, uh, you'll, and you'll have some experience doing that shortly if you haven't used it before. Uh, the main output here is just a multi-FASTA file. Okay, so we have, um, 
Nothing super fancy to look at. It's just a fast to file, like any other fast to file. There, there's a couple of things that are, are useful to, to note here, though. Um, if we have, so we have the accessions for the transcripts, and I have uh, I've got to update this to be consistent with our, our current representation. But basically, you have uh, you have an accession value for the transcript, and the the prefix for that for that accession value. Is, is meant to represent like a gene identifier, and I say gene in air quotes because you know it's not like a real gene in a lot of cases. Uh, these are just transcripts that are clustered together, and, and presumably they come from the same gene. Uh, but we're still not good at teasing apart parologous transcripts from differential isoforms uh, of the same gene, um, but they're related in some way. They ha they have some sequence that's shared in common, and um, and they'll have different isoform numbers. So in this case, we have uh, we have a prefix. Here we have a seq one and we have a seq two, but they share the same prefix. So we know that basically from the same gene, um, but they're different isoforms of that gene, and they have some sequences that are shared, and they have some sequences that are unique. And we can look at the um, the path representation here. This is basically indicating the the node in the graph, just a node number, and the region in the sequence that corresponds to that node in the graph. Okay, so if we compare uh, these two paths, we see, okay, the paths are the same, but this one here has this uh, this blue bit here in the middle that's not in the other one. Well, this is the this is the sequence that's really unique to this isoform. All right, in this example, this this blue piece is actually the red piece from the mouse isoform I showed you earlier. Guys, okay, a skipped exon in one isoform that's not found in the other. Okay, so this can be uh, somewhat useful. And there are other tools. There's a tool called Bandage that um, we're not going to have time to play with. Uh, but it's a nice, has a nice GUI interface, and you basically upload your Trinity FASTA file into Bandage, and um, it'll give you a, a graphical view of um, yeah, pieces that are unique, pieces that are shared, and it'll it'll give you a pretty structure for it. All right, so if I just Google Bandage uh, Trinity oops. Assembly. Yeah, so this is pretty cool software, uh, and they have different versions: Windows, Linux, Mac. Uh, but you can basically upload your your Trinity assembly into this. We could try it later, depending upon if we have time for it or not. Um, and uh, if you have, yeah, you know, this is actually this is a genome. This is not a Trinity transcript. This would be a crazy Trinity transcript if that's what it was. Uh, but basically, you'll end up with a whole bunch of like you know, all of your genes will be shown down here and. If you have alternative splicing isoforms, then you click on one that has an interesting structure, zoom in on it, and, um, and gain some more insights into that. All right, any, uh, any questions? Yeah. How, how, how often do you have KMERS that are from completely unrelated part of the genome just by random chance, right? So you have like a connection. Right. Yeah, it doesn't happen that often unless you, unless you have large gene families. What is K? So K, well, K is 25 for okay, what we yeah. use in Trinity, um, and 25 is relatively unique. And once you start getting below like you know 19, I think you start running into trouble. Um, but yeah, 25 is, is a relatively unique camera size. Uh, but you still have issues. I mean, you have you have, um, you know olfactory receptors in mice. I mean, you got like a thousand of these things. Um, you know, some are more closely related than others. Um, other genes like kinases, um, they have you know shared kinase domains. Um, they have these certain domains that just show up at high frequency, and occasionally you have a camera that's uh, uh, that'll show up. Um, so it happens, but um, in all the, the experiments that we've done for like uh, trying to figure out like what's the optimal K value for uh, for Trinity, uh, 25 seemed to be the optimal. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, Illumina is pretty good. Like we, there's not too many misreads, um, but we are trying to combine pack bio data for the length of the, 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 the error rates are pretty rough. Right. How do you maybe combine? Like do you have like long reads that are error prone with a bunch of short accurate reads. Right, right. Uh, so eventually there'll be a version of Trinity that can handle like a wide variety of different data types. Mm -hmm. I we're talking at least like a couple years away. Um, the latest version of Trinity is actually capable of incorporating pack bio reads along with Illumina data, um, but these are these are pack bio reads that have been carefully error corrected. All right, so you have to go through the whole ISO seq pipeline and 
um, or use some other error correction strategy. Because um, Trinity is not going to be able to handle uh, long reads that have lots of, you know, that are like 85% identical to reference, or 15% error is another way of saying that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, ideally, you know, in, in terms of like the longer roadmap for where Trinity is headed, um, Nanopore, you know, dirtier pack bio, um, and, and other, other retypes.